Okay, I think we are set. Everybody's here. All right, so this is Kelly up here with the, the flowers and the cool things on the wall behind them. Uh, and Kelly's going to give us a really cool talk on how they make things like this. So take it away. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Molly. And uh, thanks for everybody coming out today and also the DC Public Library for, for giving me this opportunity. So diving right in, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my work and my journey creating vegan taxidermy, uh, talk a bit about my process, and then take some questions. So uh, jumping in, uh, I, I, I've kind of always been uh, creating and making things since as long as I can remember. Um, it brings me a lot of joy to be able to create in, in the physical world and the physical space and and sort of bring fantasy to life. Uh, I do this as sort of an escape in a lot of ways. The, the actual process of making things uh, is really relaxing for me. And then of course the end results are that my, my apartment is, is filled with all of this. And I always joke with folks that uh, our, our apartment basically looks like a, a five-year-old's drawing come to life because there's just creatures on basically every white wall that we have. And uh, I like to use a lot of colors everywhere else. So uh, in terms of kind of where I started with this, uh, I had taken a sculpture class in, in college and learned the more traditional uh, woodworking and some welding techniques. Uh, and, but the paper shape piece didn't really come till later. Um, I only started this about six years ago when I moved up here to DC. Uh, I'd done a little bit of paper macheing before that. Uh, the first picture you see here with balloons, that was kind of my first foray actually uh, when I was still down at Atlanta and I thought it'd be fun to, to decorate the house and spruce it up, but they're fairly simple as you can kind of see here that it was just paper mache balloons. And really the reason I was drawn to paper mache was that uh, for one, uh, you can do it in your house. Uh, it's a little bit messy, but you can still get it done. And then the other piece of it, it's, it's pretty cheap. Uh, so as a graduate student, that, that was up my alley. When I came up to here to DC, I had a, a bit more time to spend on this, this kind of thing, and a lot of white walls, and I didn't really want to just kind of cover them with standard posters or pictures. So that kind of inspired me to, to figure out what, what I wanted to make. And I remember years and years ago, I think it was actually at the Juicy Couture stores, they had real taxidermy on the walls. Uh, they, I think there were actual like goat and sheep heads, but they had dressed them up with like lipstick and pearls and hats and ridiculous. And I didn't want to have actual dead animals on my wall. Uh, but I thought it would be fun to, to do something inspired by that. So this here on, on the right is uh, the, the first piece that I made. It's kind of hard to see front on, but it's this kind of wide, flat-faced uh, antelope. Don't remember the species. And kind of, it was all a happy accident from there. Uh, when I completed this, I, I was just excited to move on from there. So kind of going from there, and these are roughly sort of in, in chronological order of when they were made. The, the next creature I made was a dictic, which is actually a very small antelope species that lives in Africa and, and kind of gave her the Jackie O treatment, because why not? And then here's the, the elephant I made, which actually, it's hard to see scale wise, but it's about four feet across at the widest. And uh, really kind of going for that uh, punk rock showgirl look a little bit with the piercings and uh, the, the headpiece. And kind of going from there, um, this is a vampire bat, again, with a lot of piercings and the fun hat and the pink cabochons. Uh, really what sort of the way I, I pick my creatures as I go through this is that I, I'm re usually looking for interesting shapes and also a lot of times as as someone with training in biology, uh, excited by, excited as I create these creatures to learn more about sort of their specific features and what they do, like the vampire bats, giant ears, and the way they work as satellite dishes. Um, so yeah, and then 
here's a chameleon that I made. Um, it's mostly made out of large pieces of cardboard. Um, the, the big cone eyes, those are actually made out of, of tin foil, as I'll kind of talk about more in terms of process later. None of these creatures are, are particularly hollow. They're actually full, filled with lots of recyclables and packing materials and sometimes foil. And I think this one I actually painted with house paint. So that's what I had. Uh, moving on, uh, this is actually an anglerfish and I was inspired by uh, the, the anglerfish that live uh, deep at the bottom of the ocean have their actual angler that they use to, to attract food uh, actually lights up. So uh, being rather cheeky about it all, uh, I got a, some Christmas lights, battery powered Christmas lights and actually built them into the head. So there's actually lights all along the, the angler and then inside you can see uh, there's a little sort of light area and I made, I have the big open mouth and made those big, big clear eyes uh, that uh, you can kind of see the light coming through. And then I actually, of all things, got some replacement chandelier glass. So it's actual chandelier glass hanging from the front. Um, and then the teeth themselves are made out of uh, one of those plastic sleeves that you get in binders, because that's what I had. Uh, here's a praying mantis. Uh, it has, uh, what is that? Uh, like the dry cleaner hanger antennas, took those apart. Um, I really, what, here I was excited to explore the sort of interface between the wall and the creature and how the sort of headboards that these like real taxidermy is actually attached to kind of serve as a, a frame for, for a particular animal. So here I kind of wanted to have it sort of look like it was bursting out of some gold uh, crystals or fractals or something. And then to be extra fun, uh, the eyes actually glow in the dark because I felt like it. Uh, here we have uh, a jackrabbit with the big long gated ears, obviously uh, taken to the max. Um, plastic crown from Chuck E. Cheese that uh, I put some sparkly pipe cleaners on and some extra rhinestones. It's a little hard to see in the photo. And of course, uh, Warthog. I'd say going through this, I, I definitely knew I wanted the shape. And I think at the time I knew I wanted to do this blue glitter. But I would say in terms of decorating um, and process, this was a bit more of a, a happy accident that after I sort of did the initial painting, I I kind of, the vintage clown baby uh, theme just kind of all came together. Sometimes uh, the decorating sort of pre-planned in my head from the start and other times by the time I get to that phase, it just kind of hits me and I, and I run with it from there. Um, here's a, a sea dragon. So they're relatives of the more common seahorse, but they have a, that more elongated snout and kind of different looking bodies and was having fun obviously playing with chain here and and studs and all of the the cabochons I had a giant box of them and put them to good use. Uh, here's a, a rhinoceros beetle kind of uh, relatives to the the stag beetle. Um, when you actually see these creatures up close they have these weird sort of alien looking faces but these are like this interesting shapes to their head which is why I chose it. Um, and had fun exploring all those different shapes and really accentuating it with the paint job. And then some of the fun part too, here just to, to point out creative use, the eyes are ping pong balls. And then um, that nose piece there, or where, well, they don't have noses, but you get what I mean. Uh, that I think was some, a bracelet or some wire bent into place and some bra findings and some binder rings and clips and whatnot that I'll just super glued together and, and painted and rhinestoned and we look like we have a full piece there. And then kind of after making a series of these I wanted to sort of further explore outside of just the animals themselves and, and move on to, to fungi and plants and in a, in a few minutes I'll even show you uh, some of the ecosystems that I started to get into. So here we have a picture of some mushrooms that I put together and they also glow in the dark and they're sparkly because again, why not? Uh, I kind of make decisions based on what makes me happy and what seems fun and 
and sometimes makes people think. Um, I was really inspired by Kesha's sort of pa pastel rainbow uh, period she had a few years ago, and that kind of inspired that paint job. And then on the other side, we have a bunny-eared cactus. So these grow in the in the Southwest. Um, there's a lot of them in Arizona, and I was on a trip to Arizona and really drawn to all of the the, sh the shapes and textures within the, the succulents and cacti that live there. And this type of cactus in particular, their little, their little spikes that are definitely sharp and barby, uh, they're all different colors. So there's yellow ones, there's pink ones, there's purple ones. And so I thought it would be fun to replicate something similar with a bunch of mini pom-pom balls. And then here's actually my, my favorite piece. She's a giraffe. Um, and trying to show you the details of her head, it doesn't fully do it justice. She's about, and I'm looking at her right now, about four or so feet tall in real life. And uh, as you can see here down at the bottom, she's, a, she's attached with a wall mount, but because I really wanted to get that full fantasy, like she had a single attachment point, but also dealing with the reality of physics. Um, she actually, you can see here in the middle picture, has a, has a ring in the back of her head and chain coming off that so she can actually be supported on the wall with that additional anchor point. And then um, this one I wanted to point out, and if, you, if you're if you already a creator yourself um, or thinking about getting into it, she, she was an example where I pretty quickly fabricated her and got all the shapes and paper mache to her and knew where I was going with it. And then I kind of got stuck. And this will happen a lot of times. And, I decided to just kind of be patient and I, I put her away in the corner for like three or four months. And then finally one day it just, it all clicked. And then I kind of, I spent the next like six to eight hours just full bore decorating all of it came together, painting her ears, adding the earrings. Um, as you can see, I like to wear flowers in my hair. And so I made her her own flower crown. And then the eyes are actually cut up ping pong balls. Uh, glued into place, and then I just used some construction paper for, for the eyelashes. And then kind of this is where I started to sort of explore the idea of sort of ecosystems, and instead of just focusing on individual animals, how I could show the relationship of different plants and animals together. Uh, so this is actually supposed to represent a kelp forest because it's a big kelp strand. Um, as someone that grew up in Southern California, I uh, the, the West Coast uh, kelp forests really hold a special place in my heart. So kind of building off of that, wanting to add lots of smaller creatures. So we have the kelp here and down, down at the bottom, you can sort of see there's some little sea urchins I made and some starfish. It shows the actual they don't actually have true roots, but the kind of anchor point to the roots down there. There's a, a kelp crab, as you can see in that photo, and this is what, I don't know if I'm showing it right, but it's fairly large. And it made it fairly sparkly because, again, it just felt right. And then on the other side here, we have a, a baby California bat ray. Um, again, sort of an animal that's very near and dear to me. And that's where I really first started to uh, explore beyond sort of the standard foil and cardboard and whatnot, the use of bubble wrap, actually, and I'll, I'll start pointing out uh, elsewhere I've used it. It is a fabulous building material. So uh, yeah, it was a way to get the curves and the shapes and actually the sort of raised middle part of its body, I think was actually a, a nori container, like the dried seaweed snacks, cut it up and put it in there. And then here's a different, uh, picture of some of this to, to give you a better picture of the view of the crab and then the, the kelp itself I think is eight, nine, ten feet tall. I, I jointed it and did it in two uh, chunks but it hangs as one on the wall and this makes me very happy. And then here kind of full fantasy. This is a, a pitcher plant and they, they grow here in the U.S. in bogs. Um, originally I was going to kind of do this more as one of the hanging ones uh, that you can find at, at garden stores, but then decided I really wanted to show that that long kind of streamlined shape. And then this is another one where I used the the bubble wrap envelopes to really get the curve of the top part. And then we have uh, 
the, the fangs are just made out of, of sanded cardboard and then some hot glue to because I really wanted to get that gum effect and, and just painted that up. And then, of course, the ridiculous lip ring and the beauty mark because why not? And then here's a cassowary. Um, they're sort of like emus and, and ostriches. They're, they're large flightless birds that live in Papua New Guinea and, and Afri or Australia, excuse me. And uh, really drawn to this because the biology related to cassowaries is really fascinating to me. They basically have a fingernail coming out of their head. It's made out of keratin, which is like our fingernails. Uh, so I thought it'd be fun to, I really wanted to show they have these large kind of fluffy black bodies and then these small tiny little pinheads at the end of this long skinny neck. So I wanted to, that shape was really exciting and fun to me and then kind of dressed her up like a, a 50s secretary with the pearls and the earrings and, and even made her a pair of glasses. Again, just cardboard, hot glue. Um, again, I think I used some clear, it's hard to see in the photo, but there are clear lenses on there from from some plastic sheets that I had for something else. And then these are my, my two full-sized uh, bat rays. They actually hang on our ceiling here in the living room where I'm sitting. Um, I just was inspired to do them and, and went with it. They're, there's a little bit of wire on the inside of them for the initial sort of shape so I could bend the wings into the right, uh, right positions that I wanted. But basically these are just made out of layers and layers and layers and layers of, of bubble wrap envelopes. Then with, with a healthy layer of masking tape and, and paper mache. And of course, like many of the other creatures you've seen, uh, they also have, have some jewelry and, and lipstick and beauty marks and whatnot. And, uh, I like the aesthetic of, of piercings, as you can see, I, I have my nose pierced, but what's more fun for me uh, when adding piercings to, to the animals is sort of makes you think like, if these were animals sort of walking around a la Bojack Horseman, uh, where would their piercings be and sort of what scale and size and whatnot, and I just get a kick out of that. And then for extra drama, I gave them kind of those change, the chains that go across their body. And then here is uh, some mushrooms that I did. These are inky cat mushrooms. So um, if you ever have a chance to, I have not seen one in the wild yet, but I really want to. Uh, basically the bottom part of them starts to disintegrate and turn into this black goo with these big sort of gooey drops. Um, it sort of looks like when you have that like loogie that just keeps hanging there and won't drop. And I really wanted to recreate that visual. So. Uh, Caps are again made with uh, packing envelopes uh, and bubble wrap. And then the drops here uh, are just aluminum wire that, that I poked up in there and then some model magic air dry clay, like what you give little kids to play with. And I was really able to get that visual effect that I wanted. And then here's my, my crocodile alligator. I'm not really sure. It's kind of a, a mishmash of both. Uh, this was another one kind of like the giraffe. It actually sat for almost two years, sort of half done until fairly recently I, I was inspired to, to kind of finally bring it together. Um, so the teeth are also toothpicks with model magic clay was how I really was able to get that look. And then um, the, the gold scar tissue here was uh, really a nod to uh, the Japanese kintsugi technique where uh, they fix broken ceramics, plates, bowls, whatnot, with uh, lacquer and, and gold powder and really kind of bring new life to things. And so I wanted to, to represent that here. And then of course, because it's fun, give them multiple tongue piercings, including actually the barbell in the middle of the tongue is, um, if you guys remember those uh, sugar stir sticks or, or like rock candy on a stick, um, that was actually something that I'd saved because I, I just, I liked it and kept it and sort of like a crow, I like shiny objects and so stored that away. And then when I was finishing this one up uh, a month or so ago, decided to put it in here. So it just goes to show you a uh, trash treasure, maybe. And then here's a, a couple other pieces as I finish up. There's, um, this is a, a two-headed snake that's I think mostly model clay. 
Um, I was watching a little too much uh, of season three of American Horror Story and the promos had some cool multi-headed snakes and so I thought I'd make my own. And then here on the other side is actually a uh, life-size life saguaro cactus. It's uh, six plus feet tall and lives in our house. Um, and that was actually really inspired by one of my favorite artists, Charlie Harper. Um, he, you can see some of his work here in the middle of the screen. He, his style was basically trying to replicate or to, to characterize animals in as few shapes and lines as possible. And so it has a very, very distinctive style, but he also um, sort of, I think he had training in biology, uh, did a lot with the park service and other groups, including this huge set of posters that were all of these different ecosystems across the US. And this um, desert poster in particular struck me. So you can actually see in the cactus that I made, I created a bunch of holes and whatnot that at one point I was gonna fill with a bunch of individual birds and smaller animals and little pieces and, and still might get to someday. And of course down here, you see my little bat that, that belongs there. So that's all about sort of examples of my, my work. And now I want to kind of turn to the process piece. And the, the biggest thing I, I want to say here is like, don't, don't be afraid to, to try. Um, it might be something where the first couple times you, you go at making anything, uh, it might not turn how you want. But if you, you keep going and keep trying, you can hone your techniques and hone your process and find what works for you and really kind of narrow it down. Part of the joy of making for me is, is finding new techniques, testing them out, exploring them, getting them to work, and, and just being able to bring my vision to light. And the other thing I'll bring up here, and I'll show you a bit in a little bit too, is in terms of creating these, I feel like sometimes folks get overwhelmed with paper mache because they assume that it's hollow on the inside and that you have to use chicken wire and have to create this huge hollow structure and then you gotta like do the whole flour paste thing on the stove and whatnot. You don't have to do any of that. I don't do any of that. You'll find whatever techniques work for you. Um, and just remember to have fun with it. So in terms of tools and materials, um, kind of as I've mentioned throughout, uh, I use a lot of recyclables and whatnot, um, bubble wrap envelopes, boxes, uh, bits of cardboard. Uh, the cactus, for example, has uh, two coffee cans in it because <laughs> that's what I had. Um, so part of it's that that it's it's basically free at that point, but the other part for me, it's a way for it to avoid going to the landfill or trying to recycle it and and it not necessarily going where it needs to go. So I like to use that. Um, I also use uh, sometimes use wire and foil to help with that initial structure. Um, the wire piece. Uh, use whatever wire you can get. I will say for a lot of the, the piercings and more modal, moldable pieces, I really like to work with aluminum wire. Um, it's very lightweight and very bendable, but you can also get thicker gauges that, that give you the right visual look, or at least what I'm looking for. Um, of course, uh, sharp implements, marking tools. I go through a lot of hot glue. At this point, I buy 10 pound boxes of hot glue. Um, it's very useful in this context. And then I also use a ton of masking tape. So after I build, and I'll show you photos in a moment, after I build sort of the initial structure, first blush, I go ahead and wrap the entire thing in a, in a couple layers of masking tape. And it's, it's sort of like priming, sort of like when you spray primer down before you paint something and it just makes everything go on more smoothly. Um, by working with the masking tape, I'm able to get all the smooth shapes and, and kind of smooth down points and get rid of bubbles and weirdness uh, before I go about paper macheing it. And really the paper mache layer for me is just kind of adding an extra layer of strength to the entire thing. In terms of the paper mache part, um, sometimes I use Mod Podge, sometimes I use Elmer's glue, water it down a little bit. I don't you can also do the classic sort of uh, like the boiled flour paste, whatnot. It's whatever works for you, whatever you have access to. 
So that's kind of uh, in terms of structure, uh, moving on to the, after the fabrication piece to the kind of the fun stuff of actually painting and decorating. Um, as I mentioned, the, the model magic's really useful to get teeth, uh, drips, um, just whatever you need to kind of fill in eyelids sometimes. Uh, in terms of, and it's really easy, it dries quick, it's easy to paint. In terms of, of paint, um, you can use whatever. As I mentioned, I've used $1 poster paint, I've used house paint. Um, at this point, for the most part, I use uh, heavier body acrylics, really just because that's what I like. Uh, they're vibrant colors and I don't have to paint as many layers. I'm kind of lazy. Uh, in terms of brushes, use what you have. Um, you don't need that many. I have uh, some medium sized brushes that I like to use and then I usually have like one or I have one or two bigger brushes to to paint more serious surface area that I like to use. So that's that green brush there. Because um, when you're working on something that's four feet tall, it, it can take a while if you're using a small brush. And then uh, in terms of decorating, I just kind of collect uh, random bits and doodads as I go. So here's a picture of my, my tackle box that, that's got studs and screws and just all kind of Barbie shoes, all kinds of random things that, that I, I end up pulling out and kind of have at the ready. Um, you never know what you could use something for. Uh, one, one product I will say uh, that I find really useful uh, when when kind of attaching some of this is E6000, which is a gel super glue, basically. Um, drag queens use it all the time to bedazzle stuff, and I highly suggest it. It makes things a lot easier than traditional really runny super glue and gets the job done where hot glue doesn't work. And then uh, kind of finally here, I, I didn't used to, but now sort of thinking about getting my pieces to last longer, uh, I definitely try and shellac them more at the end here. So that's why I have a picture of that in the middle. And it also can be a way as you're working along that uh, you get sort of a, a clear or a glossier or a wet look to things. So I've also used it stylistically. So that's kind of tools and materials. And of course I can answer questions at the, the end more specifically, but wanted to kind of walk through the process because I've talked through it, but it it's kind of hard to maybe visualize some of this. So I wanted to show you uh, I started a, a beluga whale last week um, and specifically took pictures so I could show you guys today. So here we have a, a buddy uh, that, that gave us some, basically they were uh, mashed like molded cardboard bits for shipping like bottles of wine. And so that was sitting around in our house and then the cardboard boxes. So the, the big thing I, I'd point out is I usually try and put hooks on uh, before at the start of any project. So that middle picture there, you can see there, that's the, the back piece that will sit flush against the wall. Um, it's something that I've done it both ways where I, I add the hanging element towards the end. Um, it really just saves you a lot of heartache and frustration to just kind of build it in at the start. So I have the main piece and then here we can see, I started to cut up that cardboard, started to hot glue, tape it down. I was making a blue whale, so we're trying to get that big head shape. And then here's a side view. And then from there, uh, started to take my bubble wrap and just tape it around that mass and kind of shove more in and kind of smooth out to get that sort of roundedness. And then for the front part, um, I just kind of mashed up a bunch of just regular bubble wrap that I had and started to tape over that to get sort of the dome, dome look. And then here we can see I've really got that mass on their head is called a melon. It's a, a big kind of jiggly fat deposit that they think helps with um, vocalization underwater for them. Because belugas are also known as the canary of the sea, which I think is just great. They're very vocal and gregarious. And then here you can see sort of I've, I've taped up the front of the head and then uh, went ahead and took another envelope and kind of cut that into two parts. And that's how I started to get those kind of goofy duck lips that they have and tape that down. And here, uh, just showing you that continuing to tape, continuing to put layers on, and it starts to look more and more like a whale, hopefully. And sort of that last picture, sort of, I was starting to look at where eye placement would be, where its blowhole would be, 
uh, and really coming together. And then admittedly, last night I sat down and got got excited and got created, cre creating and forgot to take some um, action shots in the middle of all that. But uh, yesterday, oops, so we did that. Yesterday, I went ahead and actually was trying out a new technique where I got all of the masking tape layers done. And then instead of doing a, a layer of paper mache, I actually just coated all of the masking tape in a thick layer of Mod Podge. And it worked fairly well. It's not as strong as the, the paper mache, but wanted to bring that up just as an example that for as many of these as I made, I'm always sort of finding new ways to try new techniques, refine existing techniques and go from there. So she's uh, drew some serious inspiration from uh, Hedy Lamar and Ziegfeld Follies uh, with that, that crown piece. And then um, went ahead and of course gave her some lipstick, uh, some ping pong balls for eyes, uh, had some fake eyelashes sitting around actually and don't really have much use for them right now being at home. Uh, so gave them to her and really kind of just pulled it all together. Uh, and then just to, to give you some other sort of in progress shots to sort of conceptualize some of this um, for when I'm adding piercings or hanging points or anchor points or whatnot, a lot of times I'll, I'll poke those first and, and pilot the holes and, and check if things fit before I go ahead and paint it. And it just, make sure I have the placement right and that if it just makes it easier to pop in the piercings at the end rather than potentially have to re-poke holes and poke them in the wrong place and whatnot. Here's a picture of the the pitcher plant and you can kind of see for that one um, paper and shade that bubble wrap with um, I think there are those like coupon inserts you get in a newspaper and then to get that cool red lip look I actually did a series of wire rings around that and then I think I took tissue paper that I just kind of draped over and that's how I got that shape um, so sort of where, the, where there's a will there's a way to get get whatever thing you want it just kind of takes a lot of creativity and patience and testing and then down here is a picture of the alligator uh, sort of early on um, we had a bunch of foam from a desk that we bought that when I looked it up was really not recyclable so uh, I was trying to find a way to use that. And there you can kind of see where I'm starting to build up the shapes. And then uh, just to remind you guys all that uh, I'm man I managed to pull this all off in our apartment. It, our apartment functionally doubles as a studio. So this is a, a shot of the, the cassowary and the pitcher plant drying in our shower. Um, it's a little messy working with paper mache indoors, but it can be done. We have a carpeted apartment and uh, our carpet still looks fine enough and then just sort of here the uh inky cap mushrooms to kind of show you where i was starting to figure that out and the the bat rays sitting outside drying which i got a kick out of that because it kind of reminded me of like the touch and play pools at like a sea world or aquarium and our little outdoor veranda space just looked very happy at that time and, and that's all I got for you guys in terms of presentation. Uh, thank you everyone for, for coming out and also Molly in the library again and, and happy to take any questions from folks. Yeah, um, I'm gonna actually scroll back through and look at some of the questions that people typed because uh, we got a couple during the presentation. Um, Let's see. One person asked, how, about how long does it take to make each of these? How many hours are we looking at? <laughs> uh, a while. It's, it's a labor of love. Uh, I would say for building the actual form with the, the packing materials and the initial sort of masking tape, that can be anywhere from like 20 minutes to a couple hours. Um, that goes pretty quick because when you have big pieces, you can kind of mash that together. Uh, the paper mache part itself usually doesn't take terribly long. It's more you just have to wait 30 minutes to an hour, two hours between um, uh, between coats, which can be time consuming and, and frustrating and whatnot. Um, and then in terms of 
painting and, and decorating and whatnot, again, it's more sort of drying time more slows me down more than anything else. So I'd say these these pieces, I usually don't do anything like from true start to finish all in one go. And it's usually broken up over many days or, or weekends, but I think the beluga maybe was six hours, which was on the shorter end. And then the kelp, which was a lot more intensive because I had to laminate sets of piece of paper and, and hot glue each of them, the blades and all the layers of paint and glitter and whatnot, that was 20 to 40 hours maybe. I don't really keep track of time. Um, mm. It brings me, I'm just happy working away, but they're somewhat labor intensive, but worth it. Paul asked, is the giraffe a self-portrait? <laughs> uh, no, not, not exactly, but I think all of the creatures have, have different sort of inspirations that I can relate to. Uh, Jenny asked, how long do they usually last? Which I assume means how long does the art break down over time, I guess? <laughs> well, that's an ongoing, a uh, good question, ongoing experiment. So that first one that I showed you with the sort of plain with the flowers around it, that was created maybe six years ago and still going strong. I would say the, the paper mache starts to get brittle. So I definitely, I dropped the elephant in a move and kind of she has some rips on her, her trunk and nothing really happens to him sitting on the wall. Uh, there's a couple of them, like the one behind me, uh, my partner and I continually crash into that one. And I've had to- <laughs> Oh <repeat>. no. <laughs> yeah, we have certain rules about where things go in our house now, uh, which is fair for safety. Uh, sitting on the wall, they're pretty sturdy. If you have to move them, they, they're kind of delicate. So that's the challenge. All right. If anybody else has any other questions, you can type them in chat. I'm still monitoring it. Um, where do you get, so you got some of this stuff from as like packing material. So some of it's upcycling. Um, where, where are you getting like the chains and things like that? Yeah. So a variety of places. Uh, I'd say one of my favorite art stores is also the hardware store is part of that. And that's where a lot of the paint and adhesives and, and wire comes from. And then uh, sometimes I'll order stuff online. Um, usually paint, I like to go to an actual art store and look at and touch. But one of my, my favorite places that, that I wanna shout out where I get a lot of my fun um, doodads and bits and pieces and whatnot is this place called uh, Scrap Be More, which is up in Baltimore for the folks here in the DMV area. They're, they're basically like the goodwill of craft supply, I like to say. Um, they're, they're a secondhand creative reuse store. Um, so everything's secondhand, it's, it's really cheap, and it's been a wonderful way to sort of buy random things that I, I wouldn't necessarily be able to justify otherwise. So if you have a chance to go up there, they have all sorts of um, acrylic paint and paint brushes. Um, the, the stars on the beluga whale, actually, that was like a set of studs, um, from a, uh, a little baggie that I, I got at, at Scrap. And of course, too, if there's other things you're into, they have all sorts of yarn and sewing supplies and, and all of that good stuff. So I'm all for that, reusing what we already have. And so... I'm sure there's other places across the country where you guys can kind of find those sort of secondhand stores. Oh, we have a bunch more questions. Um, how do you come up with the colors? Do you base it on the natural color of the animal? Do you like to give them a glow up or is it a combo? <laughs> um, it really just depends. Uh, sometimes keeping the natural coloring helps tell what the animal is, like the cassowaries. That, and I'm looking at it from across the room right now, um, they do have those vibrant blues and, and reds and whatnots on them. And that's kind of helpful to identify the animal. And uh, let's see, what else? The yes and no. Uh, more so, I think it's sometimes kind of fun when I can to change it up, like the warthog being sparkly blue, because why not? Um, and of course, I, I love to give them 
for the most part, uh, lipstick and beauty marks and nose rings and the whole nine because it just makes it better. Awesome. Uh, final call for questions. We're nearing two o'clock. Um, so if anybody else wants to ask, type it in. Um, I have a request. Can you hold up the sparkly crab again? Because that looked really cool. <laughs> Aw. He does have a little face too. <laughs> yeah. How much glitter went into this crab, do you think? Uh I think there's four different colors of glitter. <laughs> there's never enough, true. Um, there's also sequins and several different kinds of rhinestones on here too. Uh I am trying to not buy any more glitter at this point because it's not the kindest to the earth but uh i think i have two or three dozen different types of glitter in my stash still that i have to work down and it's mostly because it's sparkly and makes me happy and also can be used as a threat <laughs> <So what? laughs> oh kellen asks do you name them do your sculptures have names uh, not really. I'm, I'm not one of the folks that don't really name my, my car or my bike or the animals. Usually they're just referred to as, as what species they are. Um, so the beluga head or um, the beetle head that uh, is very decisive for people. <laughs> oh, somebody just dropped Ooh, a link awesome. to eco glitter. Nice. Biodegradable so glitter. Much. There has been a lot of cool biodegradable glitter stuff going on. Um, I was looking into it for other events because I have the same the same issue that you do, Kelly, where it's it's not biodegradable and if you use it during an event or in your art and it goes into the water, then you it's have micro, right. microplastics and all kinds of things. But eco glitters come very far in the past couple awesome. of years. Thank you for sending that link in the chat. I will yeah. have to check that out. All right. Um, I think that's that's uh, going to be where we're going to wrap things up. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this talk. This is our second ever digital uh, maker talk. I'm trying to do these monthly. They're going to be digital for the foreseeable future. Um, so you can find our updates on our website, which is dclibrary.org. Um, so we'll be posting more events up there um, and I will be emailing you all after this with a link to our weekly newsletter, which is where we will have more of these. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming and thank you Kelly for doing this presentation. Thank you guys for, for tuning in and, and Molly for setting this all up. This is really fun and I was happy to, to share what I do with others. Awesome.